<clears throat> All right, good morning, everyone. Glad you can join us this morning for the Bible study. And let's see. I hope everyone's enjoying today. It is the day that people generally associate with the Lord's resurrection. Uh, obviously, Easter itself is a pagan holiday and has nothing to do with the Lord's resurrection. But uh, nevertheless, this is the day that people generally associate with that and thank God for the resurrection. Amen. Now, today's lesson uh, has absolutely nothing to do with Easter. <laughs> and uh, if you are hoping for a nice Easter Sunday lesson, I am afraid that you are going to be sorely disappointed today. But uh, if you want to learn something from the Word of God and see some things that I'm guessing you've probably not seen before, then you've tuned in to the right YouTube channel today <laughs> or the right uh, Facebook Live channel. So before we get started, let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer. Father, I come before you today and I thank you, God, for the scriptures. I thank you for this book. I pray, Father, that you'd help us to meditate and think on these things uh, this morning. And I pray, God, that your people would be helped and edified and come away knowing more about the Bible than they did before they tuned in this morning. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to do this live stream, and we just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, amen. Uh, grateful you guys are tuning in to the live streams. This uh, situation is obviously not ideal, and Lord willing, this will be over shortly. <laughs> Hopefully, by the end of the month, uh, they'll let churches back uh, and assemble. Hopefully. And if they don't... Uh, like I said, we'll just have to take it one Sunday at a time and see what we're going to do. But uh, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And in Luke chapter 1, we have the story about the angel appearing to Zacharias in the temple. And he's prophesying the birth of John the Baptist here. Let's go ahead and take a look at Luke chapter 1, verse 13. It says, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Verse 17, it says, And he shall go before him in the... In the spirit and power of Elias, okay, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. All right, so this angel said that John the Baptist was going to have the spirit and power of, Eli of Elias. In the New Testament, the word Elias means Elijah in the Old Testament. Same, same thing, Elias, Elijah. And <clears throat> the purpose of this was to try and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, this whole concept was prophesied back in Malachi chapter 4. If you go back just a couple books in your Bible, the last book of the Old Testament is Malachi chapter 4. Or is the book of Malachi. Look at Malachi chapter 4. Hold your finger there in Luke chapter 1. That's going to be our main text this morning. But I want you to see this here in Malachi chapter 4. And if you look at verse 5, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. All right. So the idea is prior to the Lord's coming, there would be an Elijah who would prepare the way before the Lord. But what no one understood in the Old Testament was that the Lord was going to come two times. Nobody in the Old Testament understood that. The Old Testament prophesied the two advents of Jesus Christ, but no one in the Old Testament understood that. And they didn't understand that the first time he was going to come and be crucified for men's sins. And then the second time he was going to be glorified and reign as a king on the earth. They didn't recognize that those were two separate 
advents, all right? Two separate comings of Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, God set these prophecies up in such a way that there would be an Elijah of sorts who would precede both of the Lord's comings. At the first advent, it was John the Baptist. It was not Elijah literally. He had the same spirit and, and power that Elijah had. But at the second advent, it's going to be Elijah literally coming to precede the second coming of Jesus Christ. Moses and Elijah both return and preach during the tribulation period. And you find that prophesied in Revelation chapter 11 and there in Malachi chapter 4, verse 4, 5, and 6. All right, so that's still future. But John the Baptist's mission is described in Luke 1.17, and I want to focus on that this morning and dissect it and teach you a few things from it. So let's look at that verse again. It says, And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. All right, now... This is my disclaimer here for just a minute. We're going to get bogged down in some necessary biblical details for just a couple of minutes. But don't worry, we will emerge and uh, it will all make sense as we get going with it. But for a couple minutes, i got to just show you a few things so you know where we're going with all this. Now, there's a couple ways you can read Luke chapter 1, verse 17. You could say that this is a three-step mission where each aspect is completely separate, and John the Baptist had to fulfill all three. Number one, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And the second part was to turn the hearts of the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. And the third is to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's one way that you could look at it. The other way you could look at this is that this is a singular mission. And each of these three things are interconnected and they're really all one. That is to say, the mission is this, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And the clarification of that is, and to turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. That is to say that the fathers and the children are not necessarily referring to actual fathers and children, although that might be one aspect of it. But the fathers and children are representative terms of the disobedient and the just. Okay, so it's saying the same thing twice. And you could say that the purpose of this mission is to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, basically, that's saying that this, rather than three individual steps that John the Baptist had to fulfill, this is all just one mission and it's just talking about the same thing. And I think that's probably what this verse is talking about. Now, when you read this, you see the words fathers, children, disobedient, and just. Now, let me ask you this. How would you match up those words? All right. If you were to look at this, you would probably think that uh, to turn the hearts of the fathers, okay, to the children and the disobedient, what would we naturally think the disobedient would be? We would naturally think disobedient would be children, you know, because that seems to stand to reason. And the wisdom, wisdom of the just, we would think to be the fathers. All right. So we would match fathers with the wisdom of the just and children to the disobedient. And then if we were to read Malachi, Malachi chapter four and verse six and overlay it onto Luke 1 17, we would have, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers, okay, to the children. And then what does it say? And the heart of the children, so we would match that to the disobedient, to the fathers, wisdom of the just. That's probably how we would line those things up, like that, all right? Now, that's always how I've read the verse until recently. Until studying my Bible, I came across this and started looking at it at a little bit of a different light and I'm going to show you a different way of looking at this verse that I believe is going to really unlock what this verse is talking about and reveal all kinds of cross-references throughout the Bible, and it'll actually make a lot more sense. So let's look at this a different way. Let's just say that rather than the children being the disobedient ones, let's just say that uh, the fathers, he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient, referring to the fathers, to the wisdom of the just, the children. 
You say, I don't know about that. Well, just, just hold on in there. Basically, what that's saying is Luke chapter 1, verse 17, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just is a reworded repeat of the hearts of the fathers to the children. So, turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and then it's going to repeat it, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. It repeats it using different words. That's called a tautology, all right, in uh, in. English literary speaking. It's a tautology, a statement which repeats an idea using near synonymous words and phrases. All right, and tautologies are very common in the scriptures. So the interpretation here is that the fathers are the disobedient ones. Fathers equal disobedient, and the children are the wise and just ones. Now that would be an ironic flip from what you would expect. And uh, this interpretation, actually, when you think about it, matches the spiritual condition of Israel when Jesus first came. The fathers, from an allegorical standpoint, are, you know, the leaders, the heads of things, you know, specifically. The ones with experience, the ones with wisdom, the ones with knowledge, the ones that people generally follow, respect, and learn from. And children, from an allegorical standpoint, are you know, simple people. They're the common folk. They're people who don't necessarily have great learning and higher education. They're the people who are the followers. They follow and respect the leaders in society. You, would, you can see those kind of allegorical matches. Uh, the fathers in Jesus's time essentially were the Pharisees. They were the leaders. They were the ones that were in positions of authority in Israel who had access and not to the scriptures and had knowledge of the scriptures. They were the ones that were responsible for the spiritual condition and the spiritual training and upbringing of the children of Israel, the, the regular people. They were responsible for that. And so the children in Jesus' time would be the common people. Okay, the common people. Now, hold that thought. The problem in Israel at that time, at Jesus' first advent, was that the fathers, the Pharisees, had no care, concern, or love for the children, the common people. The Pharisees thought that they were better than the common people. The Pharisees despised the common people. The Pharisees, who are the religious leaders, they took advantage of the common people. They abused the common people. The fathers abused the children, you might say. Yet in spite of all this abuse that was going on, the common people still respected, feared, and revered the Pharisees. And you find that throughout the Gospels. I mean, evidently, they had some kind of spiritual Stockholm Syndrome <laughs> where they kept loving and following the very people who were abusing them. And you see this in churches sometimes, too, honestly. I mean, it's very frequent in false religions, but it happens in conservative, fundamental, Bible-believing churches sometimes, too. Sometimes the spiritual leaders, the ones who ha are, you know, the pastors or, or whatever, abuse the people, the children, so to speak. They take advantage of them. And God hates that. John the Baptist's mission was primarily to turn the hearts of the disobedient fathers towards the obedient, the wise, and the just children. His job was to turn the fathers to the children. You see, the problem wasn't the people. The Bible says that the common people, i.e. the children, heard Jesus gladly in Mark chapter 2, verse 37. The common people loved Jesus. They loved hearing what he had to say. It was the Pharisees that didn't love Jesus. You see, the problem at the first advent was the Pharisees. It was the fathers. You know, if it hadn't been for the Pharisees, Israel would have accepted their Messiah by all indications. I mean, the crucifixion still would have had to happen because it was prophesied, uh, but it would have had, it would have had to be have, have been done by the Romans, not the Jews. But, you know, the reformatting of history had the Jews accepted their Messiah is way beyond the scope of this lesson this morning, and it's hard to even figure out, you know, it's probably not worth wor worrying about what would have happened if. But basically, the problem was the Pharisees. Uh, the point is, the Pharisees were the ones who caused the hearts of the people to turn away from Christ. It was the scribes and the high priests and the Pharisees that got the people all stirred up and caused them to cry out, crucify him, crucify him. It was the Pharisees. It was the leaders. It was the spiritual leaders, the fathers, 
who were blind and consequently they led their followers, they led their children, if you will, into the ditch with them. You see, when Jesus came, the children were already prepared to receive the Lord. They were ready. And in order for John the Baptist to straighten the path like he was supposed to, he was going to have to straighten and fix the Pharisees. That's a tough job. <laughs> it's, it's tough to fix the spiritual leaders when they're all messed up. He, the common people, they heard John. The common people were baptized of John in the Jordan River. They believed that he was a prophet sent from God, which he was. It wasn't that the hearts of the children needed to be turned towards their fathers. That was already, that was already fine. The children respected the fathers. Their hearts were already towards the fathers. It was that the children's hearts, or it was that the fathers' hearts needed to be turned towards the children. The children, the common people, had love and respect for the fathers, the Pharisees. It was the Pharisees that had no care or concern whatsoever for the common people, the children. The children, <coughs> then, the common people, were the wise ones. The children were the just ones. They were the ones who judged rightly, who judged just judgment. In a strange twist of irony, when Jesus came, it was the fathers who were disobedient, not the children. You would expect the children to be disobedient, right? But here in this case, it was the fathers who were disobedient. And it was the fathers who were foolish and judged wrongly, not the children. The children had more sense than the fathers. The common person had more spiritual discernment and sense than the Pharisees. The children recognized, they said, is not this the Christ? But the Pharisees, they rejected him, right? Very interesting that the common person would have more spiritual sense than some of these religious leaders. You see a lot of that today, too. The fathers had no care for the children. The fathers were abusing the children. In Matthew 23, Jesus Christ blasts the Pharisees and exposes how they load the people down with a bunch of jobs and tasks, but, they won't, but the Pharisees won't participate themselves. Uh, Jesus blasts the Pharisees and he exposed how they do all their good works to be seen of men and praised of men. He said that these religious leaders deceive the people with their false teachings. They con vulnerable people into giving them money in exchange for their useless prayers. Uh, he, he blasted them and said that they were not bothered by sin, but pointed out that they were bothered when something threatened their financial bottom line. That's what bothered the Pharisees. Jesus pointed out that the Pharisees majored on the outward physical things, but they minored on the inward spiritual things. These Pharisees looked good on the outside, but they were wicked hypocrites on the inside, and their fake righteousness evaporated, and their inner hatred was exposed any time somebody crossed them, challenged them, corrected them, or cost them money. Jesus Christ hated that. He blasted those people. These were the religious leaders. These were the spiritual shepherds. These were the pastors. These Pharisees were the fathers who did not care for the children. You know, when John the Baptist preached against the Pharisees, what did he tell them to do? He told them to bring forth fruits, meet for repentance, right? In other words, you know, he said, bring forth, who, who told you to come get baptized? He said, bring forth fruits, meet for repentance, equal to repentance, <coughs> uh, becoming of repentance, to prove your repentance. In other words, you know, prove that you mean business. How so? How would you prove your repentance? How would, you, how would they bring forth fruits, meet for repentance? Well, they would have to stop the abuse and extortion they were committing. They would have to help the people instead of hurt the people. You know, they're hurting the people. They need to repent and start helping the people. They need to give back the things they had stolen. Those are the fruits, the evidences that a person's repentance is sincere. A person who goes through the motions, you know, in this case, is baptized in the Jordan River, but there's no indication of any kind of change in that person, we would have a right to question the sincerity of their repentance, right? Well, it's kind of the same thing for New Testament salvation. 
you know, uh, or a person, let's just say, just repeats some prayer, you know, that you tell them. They just repeat, repeat a prayer. They don't really mean it. There's no indication of any kind of change in that person. We have a justified reason to question that person's repentance, that person's sincerity. I'm not saying, you know, that you have to be perfect or conform to some kind of list of standards and uh, dress a particular way to prove that you're saved. But listen, there should be some kind of change in moral character and conviction in your life when you get saved. The Holy Spirit of God Almighty, when you get saved, comes inside of you at salvation, and that should result in some kind of change in your life. <laughs> the Holy Spirit of God Almighty comes inside of you, and you tell me there's not going to be any kind of change? Something's wrong. Technically, just because you say you're saved doesn't mean that I have to believe it, <laughs> okay? The burden of proof is on you. Now, maybe you truly are saved, but you're just living like the devil. If you're saved, you're saved, and nothing can change that, thank God. But don't expect me to think that you're telling the truth when your life indicates that you're lying, okay? Now, that's a big problem today. Uh, in fact, today, you know, Joel Olstein is having a Easter extravaganza at his church complete with uh, rock performances from Kanye West and Mariah Carey. You know, Christians these days are living just as sinful and filthy as the world. Now, if you're not, don't worry about it. I'm not talking to you. All right? Don't let the devil put false guilt on you saying that you're not doing good enough and you're not, you're not clean enough and you're not perfect enough and you therefore must not be saved. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who say, oh yes, I'm saved, but then live wicked, sinful, ungodly lives. That's what I'm talking about this morning. And part of the reason for that problem is that the fathers, the pastors, the ones with the word of God and the knowledge and that God has called into the ministry, they are not teaching the children properly. The children are going astray because the fathers are failing their job. The Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Well, what do we have in the last days of the church age? A departing, a falling away from the faith. What's the problem? Why are all these children, these new believers, falling away from the faith? Because they've never been trained up in the way that they should go. The fathers are neglecting their job. Just like it says over there in Jeremiah 23, the Lord uh, rebukes those prophets and the pastors because they've perverted the words of the Lord. And he says, if they had stood in my counsel and caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. What was the problem? They were just going around giving people what they wanted to hear, saying, peace, peace, when there was no peace. They were saying, oh, God's okay with your sin. God doesn't mind your sin. God, God loves everybody the same, whether saved or lost. That was, they were giving false doctrine to the people. They were giving false assurances to the people, false comforts to the people. And consequently, because they didn't preach against their sin and they didn't give them the words of God, the people departed from the faith. They said, oh, God lo God, God's okay with my sin. He doesn't mind, so I'm just going to continue in it. Those were the false preachers. And they caused the children to go astray. All right, now, the fact of the matter is, a, pers a Christian that's living wickedly needs to either get saved if they're not truly saved or get right with God but either way they need to repent and let, listen if someone questions your salvation maybe you should take a close look in the mirror before you get upset with that person I mean let's just face it if you look like a duck and you walk like a duck and you quack like a duck don't get mad when someone else is not really convinced when you say that you're a sheep <laughs> you know what I mean Anyway, the fathers had no care for the children. Turn to Luke chap or John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Take a look at this. John chapter 13. Give you a chance to turn there. We'll flip to a couple of scriptures here. John chapter 13, verse 33. All right. John 13, 33. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come, so now I say unto you. All right, so he says, little children. Who are the little children in John chapter 13? 
Well, it's not a whole bunch of little kinder, kindergarten kids. The, this, this conversation in John chapter 13 is taking place in the upper room after Lud uh, <laughs> Judas Iscariot has left the room. So, who, so the ones he's speaking to are the 11 disciples. These are full-grown men. All these guys are probably at least 18 years old and, old and older. And he calls all of them little children. Now that's interesting. They were, the disciples were classified as little children because they were followers of Jesus. They were obedient to his commands. They were limited in their understanding and knowledge just like a child. And so the term little children is fitting. It's kind of like a spiritual term. He's addressing these physical full-grown men as little children. Why? Because they're all new believers in him. They're all new to the faith, if you will. Okay, so that's what I want you to get. Little children in the Bible often is not necessarily physical, literal little children, like little kindergartners and babies, but it involves new believers of any age. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. As a matter of fact, if you were to read the epistle of 1 John, the term little children shows up nine different times, and it's never once referring to to little toddlers or little kindergarten kids. It's always a reference to new believers. Matthew chapter 21. All right, Matthew chapter 21, and look at uh, verse 15. Here we have in this chapter Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And the chief priests and scribes are contrasted by the little children in verse 15. Notice that. The fathers contrasted by the children, verse 15. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. You see, the chief priests and scribes contrasted by the children crying in the temple. Verse 16, <clears throat> And said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings... Thou hast perfected praise. So these, these people are saying, Hosanna to the son of David. And Jesus said they were babes and sucklings. Now, there's only one of two ways we can look at this. Either a miracle happened here, and these little uh, infants in their mother's arms all of a sudden you know, pull out their pacifier, and they say, Hosanna to the son of David, <laughs> or something like that. I mean, that would be a miracle. They can't speak at all, and now they're forming full sentences, and they're all shouting in the temple. And evidently, nobody finds this peculiar. <laughs> you know, nobody thinks that's weird. Okay, so that's one way you can look at it. A total miracle. That's a pretty bizarre way of looking at it. Or... We can look at it another way that I, I think is actually a little more consistent with Scripture. And you have full-grown adults. You have a congregation of normal people, the average person. Jesus is coming into town, riding up to the temple, and they're all saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. You know, these are people that range anywhere from 13 to 70 years old. They're just the common folk. And they're crying out. And Jesus says, Have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings? Thou hast perfected praise. These are spiritual babies. They're new believers. They're little. They're young in the faith, if you will. They're the common people. They're, sp they're the followers, you see. Um, that would also match, by the way, the cross-reference of John chapter 12, verse 12 and 13, where it simply says, much people, whereas in this passage it says, the much people were the babes and sucklings. Okay? So, turn to Luke chapter 18. Now this, like I said, this is mostly just a Bible study today. I hope this will make you think a little bit. <clears throat> this has nothing to do with the resurrection or Easter. <laughs> but uh, Luke chapter 18, look at verse 9. Nevertheless, this is the Word of God. And uh, there's a lot of Easter services where uh, you could tune into an Easter service and get a bunch of hot air. Uh, or you could get something from the Word of God this morning. So... Uh, hopefully this will be a blessing to you. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. It says, And he spake this parable unto... And when I say hot air, I'm not referring to the resurrection. I'm referring to the Christian rock concerts and the twisting of the words of God and trying to make a whole bunch of unsafe people think that they're okay with God. That's the hot air that I'm referring to. All right. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves and that they were righteous and despised others. 
Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. All right, so what you have is spiritually, allegorically, you have a father and a child. Keep that in mind. Verse 11, And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. All right? So this is a proud Pharisee who despises the man next to him. I'm not as this publican. He despises the child, if you will, right next to him. Look at verse 13. And the publican, standing afar off, would not so much as lift up his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Right? So this man is humble, and he's seeking God's favor, unlike the Pharisee. Verse 14, it says, I tell you, this man went down to his house, look at that word, justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The Pharisee was proud. The publican was humble. The Pharisee here is the one who is disobedient. The Pharisee is the father who is disobedient. The publican is likened to the child who was justified. The wisdom, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. God be merciful to me, a sinner. That publican was wise, and he was justified. Jesus says this man went down to his house justified. Now notice there's no paragraph mark between verse 14 and verse 15. Grammatically speaking, these are two very different passages that we're going about to read this next portion. And you would think there should be a paragraph mark there, because they don't seem to really have any, anything to do with each other. But I think the Holy Spirit did this so that you would see a connection between the story of the Pharisee and the publican and the lesson Jesus is about to teach now. Look at verse 15. And they brought unto him also infants, that he would touch them. All right? And it says, But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. So in Luke's account, Jesus simply says that we should be as little children when it comes to receiving the kingdom of God, receiving the gospel. But there is no specific explanation here as to what that means. Okay, How do you receive the kingdom of God as a little child? How do you do that? What does that mean? All right, let's look at the parallel, pa parallel passage in Matthew chapter 18. All right, Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Bear in mind that little children in the Bible can refer to full-grown adults. All right? Full-grown full, full -grown adults that are new believers. Because you remember, the 11 disciples were called little children. All right, now this is going to give a whole new meaning to Matthew chapter 18 that you, that you probably haven't thought of before. I know I hadn't really considered this, but look at Matthew chapter 18 and verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little children." ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So a person who believes the gospel is as a little child. When they first get converted, they're like a little child. Number one, because they're pro the reason why Jesus likens new believers to little children is because little children, you know, you tell them something and they believe it. <laughs> they don't need a bunch of proof and logic and apologetics to convince them. They have simple faith, all right, just like a new believer. And the other thing is, when a believer trusts Jesus Christ as his Savior, he is born again. Salvation is likened to a new birth. And when a child is born, obviously they start out as a baby, a little child. And when you get saved, when you're a new believer, you're likened spiritually to a little child. And now you have to grow and you have to mature and you have to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So that is to say a 40-year-old adult man who just got saved can be classified as a little child according to the Bible. Now look at verse 4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, faith and belief is directly connected with humility in the Bible. The Bible says the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And that's what the publican did. He humbled himself and the Pharisee didn't. The publican's likened to a little child. Now, in this passage, Jesus had a literal little child on his lap, a little kid on his lap, literally. But the teaching that he's trying to get across it has to do with spiritual little children, new converts, new believers. And like, you know, the way that you receive the kingdom of God is by humility and by faith, just like a little child would. All right, now with all this in mind, I want you to see verse 5, because I think this is really interesting. And whoso, whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. What's that talking about? Well, if you receive or if you help, you know, one of these new converts with something, <clears throat> Jesus Christ counts it as if you were helping him, which makes sense. You know, if your kid was out playing in the field and fell into a ditch, you know, and was in danger and was yelling for help and someone came along and helped your kid and lifted him out of the ditch and cleaned him off, you as a father, you know, let's say you came over and you saw what they did for your child, you would be as much or more appreciative towards that person for what they did for your child as though they had done it for towards you, right? You would appreciate them. You say, oh, well, you did that for my kid. That doesn't really matter because it wasn't for me. No. <laughs> it, the fact that they did very jealous and very protective of his little children, his new believers, just like you are with your little children. Now, here's the thing. <laughs> I'm not a violent person, okay? I'm really not. But when the thought comes into my mind of someone hurting one of my kids, you know, I start seeing red. <laughs> and my mind goes into very dark places very quickly. So I try not to think about that. Now, I don't believe in being naive. I think we should consider some things once in a while that uh, there are some dangerous people out there that would like to do some awful things to your children. But like I said, I try not to think about that too much because my mind goes, it, it gets very black very quickly. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure that it's the same for you too. I mean, you think about it, but listen, it's the same for God too. Look at the dark place that Jesus' mind goes to when he starts talking about someone hurting one of his little children, one of his new believers. Verse 6, But whoso shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me... You see, I've always read this as a literal child, like Jesus is preaching against child molesters and pedophiles, which obviously is an application, but it's more than that. Jesus is giving this warning to people that offend and mess up a new believer in Christ or a little child. Someone who doesn't know all the Bible, who is still trying to learn. They're trying to learn the Bible and here comes along someone and starts teaching them false doctrine. That's who Jesus Christ is aiming this warning at. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. That's probably one of the darkest things Jesus ever said in the Gospels, if not the darkest. <laughs> and, uh, you know, by the way, Happy Easter. <laughs> happy Easter, everybody. You know, I, I mean, seriously, I debated whether or not I wanted to teach this lesson today or if I should have changed it. But after praying about it, you know, I, I did pray about it. And, and the thought occurred to me that... There's a lot of people in this world, maybe a lot of people that are watching this video, and these kinds of awful things have happened maybe in their background, in their life. These kind of awful things about older people hurting younger children, that's happened to a lot of people. And uh, maybe they've just never talked about it. And maybe you're listening today and uh, a very bad person haunts your childhood memories and maybe that event caused you to question God's love for you. Or maybe that event caused you to question the existence of God. Or maybe that event uh, caused you to question God's care for you. 
Now listen, bad things happen to innocent people. It, 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 that's the truth. And part of the reason of that is because, number one, there is a devil who's a complete and total wicked demon who wants to destroy your life. He does exist. So that's part of the problem. And number two, there are evil men in this world who have a free will and can exercise their free will in any way they want. And sometimes their free will is to exercise it in such a way that it hurts you. All right? But listen, what I want you to see here is that when you see God's judgment fall on these wicked people, and someday you will, okay? When you see God's judgment fall on them for what they did against you, you won't be wondering as to whether God cares about you or not. You won't be questioning the love of God anymore. Uh, you'll know for a fact that God is very upset with these people that have hurt you in the past. You won't have any question whatsoever as to whether or not God cares. The judge of all the earth will do right. And I want to say that as a, as a mean of, means of encouragement to you this morning, if maybe you have some of this in your background, and maybe you are a victim, because there's a lot of people out there that are like that. But what I want you to see from this verse primarily is that this isn't aimed at just physical child molesters. This is aimed at false teachers who mess up believers. Offend in the Bible isn't necessarily hurting someone's feelings or making somebody mad. Offend in the Bible is used in the sense of causing someone to fall away, to quit, to give up. And the leaders and the teachers who cause believers to go astray are hated by Jesus Christ. These are the fathers who get little children screwed up on false doctrine. In other words, let me put it this way very clearly. The Roman Catholic priests, the Mormon elders, the Jehovah's Witness messengers, the Church of Christ pastors are all spiritual child abusers. They're not saved themselves, and they frequently mess up true believers with false teaching. And for that matter, let me just say this. There are some Lutheran, Methodist, Mennonite, Charismatic, Pentecostal, non-denominational, and even some various denominational Baptist preachers that could fit that description too. Any teachers that are leading people astray with false doctrine, such as works are necessary for salvation, such as works are necessary to stay saved, such false doctrine as baptism necessary for salvation, and so on, those are fathers who are offending and messing up children. And Paul had the, and when it came to the false teachers, Paul had that same spirit of jealousy that Jesus Christ had, and he said, I would they were even cut off. I wish they were dead those people that are troubling you. That's Bible. That's what Paul said. The fathers should be helping the little children to grow up and love God. But the fathers were hurting the little children and taking advantage of the little children, and it made Jesus Christ furious. People messing with little children is something worth getting upset over. It ought to make you mad that there are these stinking drag queen sodomites in libraries across this country teaching children how to do strip teases. And I'm not joking. That is literally going on in this country. That ought to make you mad. Do you even know about that? It's going on all across the country. Just check out the Drag Queen Storytime website. You'll see a whole list of all the cities that they're coming to to show your kids how to do all kinds of vulgar things. Does that make you upset? Does that even raise your blood pressure just a little that this is going on? Does it make you mad that women are killing their babies in their womb and lawmakers are trying to make post-birth abortions legal like in New York and Virginia? Does that make you mad? Does it make you mad that public school teachers with the full permission and encouragement of the government are training kids in the classroom how to commit fornication with each other in every way imaginable, that is not a joke. That is not an overstatement. I've literally seen the textbooks. Does that upset you? It ought to make you mad. If you're like your savior, <laughs> your mind goes to very dark places when you start thinking about judgment about those people. Thank God, God said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You don't have to worry about repaying these people. You don't have to worry about physical violence or anything like that. God's going to get them. And frankly, I'm looking forward to that. All right? 
that kind of stuff that I just talked about is institutionalized child abuse. But listen, don't forget that every Catholic church and every Mormon temple and every JW windowless box building is institutionalized spiritual child abuse. They're messing up little children. They're messing up the common people, teaching them false doctrine and leading them straight to hell. And it ought to make you mad. And, so, and it is worth something worth getting upset over. You know, according to the Bible, the Roman Catholic Church is the mother of all the other harlot religions. And Jesus Christ is going to cause that spiritual child molesting monster to be burned down and nuked to ashes, according to Revelation 17 and 18. He likens the total destruction of Roman Catholicism to a boulder being cast into the sea in Jeremiah 51, exactly as he threatened in Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. Happy Easter! <laughs> <laughs> oh, amen. You know, Rome has offended more little children than any other religion on earth, both spiritually and physically. And heaven sheds no tears for the destruction of unrepentant child molesters. Now, everyone in heaven is shouting hallelujah when Roman Catholic mystery Babylon is burned down. Those are saints in heaven with glorified bodies. They're sinless and they can never sin anymore. And they're shouting, Hallelujah! When Roman Catholicism, when the Vatican, when all that thing is just burned to ashes. That's what God feels about it. They're shouting, Hallelujah! When the millstone is tied around the scarlet woman's neck and she's cast into the sea. That takes care of her. That's the Bible. That's the God of the Bible. That's how you would feel the same way if somebody messed with one of your kids. Don't pretend you wouldn't. And if you think that you're just going to get along with that person and just be friendly with that person, well, I just forgive you. You're sick. There ought to be some jealousy there. You know, I have a book. It's called uh, Race Against Evil. All right. And it chronicles the true story of an Interpol agent who was uh, in a specialized wing of Interpol, I think back in the 80s, called Archangel. And his team's assignment was to track down and eliminate child traffickers across the world. And uh, they were called cleaners. That was their kind of their code name or their, their, uh, their title. They were just called the cleaners, <laughs> these assassins, that, these Interpol agents who were supposed to track down the child traffickers. They weren't just supposed to arrest them. Their job was to eliminate them, okay? Interpol. And uh, reading about the missions of the Archangel group was amazing. I mean, but uh, the criminals they chased and the crimes they committed, and he talks about some of that, uh, you know, and the things that they were doing was actually pretty disturbing. But it was quite an eye-opener as to what's going on in this world, even back in the 70s and 80s. Unbelievable stuff. And it's still going on today. And uh, I read that, and I read this man's story, and after reading it, I was thinking, man, if I wasn't saved, I would enjoy being a cleaner. <laughs> and you probably would, too, if you're a man. Maybe, maybe you wouldn't, women wouldn't appreciate that, but uh, if you're a man... Reading about some of the things that people do to little children, I think I'd enjoy being a cleaner. But the Lord has me doing a different kind of cleaning. Amen? And part of my cleaning job is to preach against the spiritual child traffickers, like the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic priests, the Mormon Church, the JW Church, Islam, Buddhism. All these false religions, these false fathers that are leading people to hell and destroying men's lives. I'm a spiritual cleaner. <laughs> Amen. Hey, by the way, if you want to support an organization that's dedicated to finding and arresting child traffickers, you ought to check out uh, Veterans for Child Rescue. That's vetsforchildrescue.org. This isn't a commercial. I'm just saying that this is actually good information that you should know. Um, it's an organization headed by an ex-Navy SEAL named Craig Sawyer. And after only being in operation for a few years, they've already made over 22 arrests of child molesters and child traffickers. And uh, by the way, another form of child abuse that this is information. This is just for free. But uh, you, ought to, you ought to check this out because another form of institutionalized government-sponsored child abuse comes in the form of the CDC's childhood vaccination schedule. And if you don't believe me, please watch the free documentary Vaxxed and the sequel that just came out, Vaxxed 2. 
Vax 2 you have to pay for, but the first one's free. Check it out. That's government-sponsored, institutionalized child endangerment and child abuse. Watch it, all right? Now, defilement and destruction of children is a very high priority of Satan and powerful wicked men in the last days. Now listen, the fathers should be caring for the children. The fathers should be defending the children. The fathers should be training the children. The fathers should be protecting the children. And Father, you ought to be protecting your children. You ought to be defending them. You ought to be training them. And if you're a spiritual leader, you ought to be doing that for the people that are, that are following you that you're trying to teach the Bible to. Teach them right. Teach them the Word of God. Not a bunch of... Uh, opinions, not a bunch of philosophy and all that humanistic garbage. Give them the book, all right? The fathers are supposed to be caring for the children, but it was the exact opposite in Jesus' day, just like Luke 117 said. But here's the other thing to think about. Luke 117 really was only half of Malachi's prophecy. Malachi chapter 4 is a direct reference to the second advent. Luke's simply made application to part of the prophecy. Luke uh, Malachi chapter 4 Verse 5, I'll read it for you, the verse right before it, in, uh, right before that verse, Malachi 4, 5 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. All right, the day of the Lord has to do with the second coming of Christ, the tribulation. The first advent had nothing to do with the great and dreadful day of the Lord. All right, the context here in Malachi chapter 4 is the second coming, not the first coming. And in verse 6 it says, And he, Elijah, shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Okay, so at the second coming towards the, what I'm trying to say is, in the last days, as we get closer to the tribulation, we have a situation just like it was in the days of John the Baptist. The hearts of the fathers need to be turned toward the children again. And we're seeing that today. Fathers don't care for the children. They only care for themselves. <laughs> but the problem in the last days is twice as bad because not only are the father's hearts not towards the children but the children's hearts aren't towards the father's either because he has to do two things turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers John the Baptist didn't need to turn the heart of the, fa the children to the fathers Elijah's got twice the problem you see in the last days the children won't have any respect for the fathers either or love for the fathers you might say that believers will have no respect for Bible teachers, even good ones. John the Baptist had it bad, but Elijah's going to have it twice as bad. <laughs> Back in Jesus' day, the fathers were the ones who were disobedient. It was the children who were just. They were justified. They were righteous. They were wise because they believed in what Jesus said. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 3-4, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You see, the way you receive the gospel and enter into God's kingdom is by humility and is, and is by faith. Salvation is a free gift that you cannot earn. Your best works... All of your good works combined are no good as far as God is concerned. Your best efforts God classifies as filthy rags in the Bible. You know, it takes humility to accept that. It takes humility for a person to admit, you know what, I am a sinner. It takes humility for someone to come to the place where they say, you know what, I am no good. I am religious, but I'm lost. It takes humility to admit, you know what, I am headed for hell. It takes humility for a person who has been religious all their life to get on their knees and cry, God be merciful to me, a sinner. That takes humility. And some people are too proud and they won't do that. Have you ever done that? Have you ever admitted, have you ever admitted that you're a sinner in need of a savior? Or all your life have you been more like that Pharisee and you come before God and you tell God how great you are and how many good things you've done and explain to God why he should be impressed with you. Is that your attitude? You need to become as a little child. I don't care if you're 70 years old. You need to become as a little child and humble yourself and simply believe the gospel. 
Salvation is by God's grace through your faith. God offers his gift of salvation for free without works. All you have to do is believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross for your sin. He took your punishment. Believe that Jesus died on a cross for your sin. Believe that he was buried and believe that he rose again the third day and receive by faith the payment that he made for you. Ask Christ to save you. Quit trusting in your own good works, in your religion, in your baptism. If you've never done so before, tell God right now, this morning, tell God, admit that you're no good. Admit that you're a no good sinner headed for hell. Tell God that. He already knows it. <laughs> Tell him that you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and rose from the dead. Tell him that you believe that. And ask God, humbly, ask him to save your soul. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God will save you, but you've got to come humbly before him. You've got to ask. You've got to believe. Amen? Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Don't wait. Make peace with God by putting your faith and trust in Him.